one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language.
my sermon ready about Wednesday or Thursday of this week, and I forgot to put the PowerPoint onto the thumb drive. I told you the heat's getting me. Or the medicine or something. So don't have any PowerPoint this morning. You're just stuck with me. Last week, as you know, was Fourth of July weekend. And one of the things we all know about the 4th of July and the Declaration of Independence is that one phrase, that we have been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as a nation for over 200 years, we have strongly pursued happiness as a right sometimes at the expense of life and liberty. So here's my question for you today. Would you rather have a lifetime of pursuing happiness, or would you rather have a lifetime filled with joy? Now what's the difference, you may ask? Well, I turn to that reliable source of all information, the internet, and there are some differences between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on outward, external circumstances, most of which we cannot control. Joy, on the other hand, comes from a deep well of things within us, and we don't worry about controlling them. They're just there, and they overpower and overwhelm us. A friend of mine one time put it this way. Say the word happiness. It kind of comes from the throat. Happy, kind of shallow. But joy comes deep with it. And isn't that how we all say the word joy? We should. It just comes from deep within us. Many of us are familiar with the phrase, happy life, no. Got that backwards, don't I? Happy wife, happy life. Or the other one, the corresponding phrase is, Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, what makes Mama happy? What makes her a happy wife? You do the things they want you to do. You pick up your dirty clothes, you take your dirty dishes to the sink, you say, I love you, whatever it is. I wouldn't say those are all shallow things, but you go a day without picking up all your dirty clothes, mama ain't happy. It's just that fleeting and that temporary. Happiness is a temporary thing. It's probably why we have to continually pursue it. Because once we have it, now we're off to the next thing to make us happy. But joy transcends circumstances. We are, in, we are in a series of sermons from the book of Philippians. And the theme of the book of Philippians is joy. And in this book, Paul talks about joy. He uses the word rejoice and joy numerous times. But even when he doesn't use the word, the sense of joy, that deep felt sense is there in his writings. You can sense it as you read it. Our text this morning is Philippians chapter 1. If you have your journal, if you don't have one, raise your hand. We still have a few in the back. We'll see that someone gets one to you. Try and stay six feet away from you. But we want you to have these. So if you don't have one, it's on page 6. The problem is there's no number at the top of page 6. The first number in this book, page number, is until eight. So flip somewhere in the middle of this thing, find a page number at the top of the left-hand page, and just go back to get to page eight and tell yourself one more flip and I'm there on page six. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1,164. You might want to hold this one, it's a little easier. But from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, Paul writes these words. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, 
making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. <clears throat> Today we're talking about fellowship, joy in fellowship. And if there's one thing churches think they understand, it's fellowship. I mean, after all, we have fellowship dinners in fellowship halls. Of course we know fellowship. But I suspect in a lot of churches, at a lot of those fellowship dinners in fellowship halls, there's not always a lot of fellowship going on. And even worse, there isn't always a lot of joy at those fellowship dinners in fellowship halls. I think sometimes we have the idea today that fellowship means we're together somewhere, probably eating, but not necessarily. But we have to be together or we just can't have fellowship. I want you to realize, as Paul is writing this letter to the Christians in Philippi, he's in a prison cell in Rome. That's about 800 miles apart. Back in those days, under ideal circumstances, you could make a trip from Rome to Philippi in about 15 days. Under less than ideal circumstances, it might take more like three or four weeks to make that trip. Paul was not with these people. In fact, he hadn't even seen some of them for likely eight or ten years. His first trip to Philippi, not even sure how long that lasted, he left. He visited the church at least one more time. But now he's in prison. He might not have seen any of these people for eight years. And he's separated by 800 miles. And yet he says, we have fellowship with one another. How do you have fellowship when you're 800 miles apart and eight years separated? And how do you find joy in that kind of fellowship? That's what I want to talk to us about today. A joy in a fellowship that transcends miles and transcends years. If you have your journal Bible, feel free to write in it. If you're using a pew Bible, please don't write in that one. But if you do, we'll live with it. But as you look in this passage, I think Paul gives us some clues to what produces a fellowship that yields joy between Christians. And joy is far better than the pursuit of happiness. In verse 3, I've circled in my Bible here, remembrance of you. One of the clues to having fellowship that leads to joy is fond memories. Paul had some really great memories with some of these people in the church in Philippi. We only know about three of them, but I'm sure there are a whole lot more. In the book of Acts, somewhere around chapter 16, Paul goes to Philippi for the first time. And one of the first people he encounters is Lydia, a businesswoman from Thyatira, probably fairly wealthy, because she's selling purple. Purple wasn't cheap. And Paul went out to the riverside and met with her and some others who were worshiping God and praying together. She heard the message of Christ and became a believer 
and a follower in Christ and invited Paul and his company to come and stay at her house while they were in Philippi. You know, when you live with somebody, you, you build some memories. They're not always good, but you build them. And sometimes even the bad ones become pleasant memories and fond memories later on in life. A little bit later, Paul was preaching in the city, and there was a girl, a slave girl, who was possessed by a demon. And this demon gave her the ability to tell people's future, and some, some guys were using her to make a fortune of telling other people's fortunes for a profit. Paul cast the demon out of her. She lost the ability to tell the future, and so the guys just cast her aside. Although it doesn't say specifically, it's good reason to believe she became a part of the church in Philippi. I'm sure she had some memories of things not all good. When you've been a demon-possessed person, now starting a church, not everybody welcomes you, I wouldn't think. Paul also had an encounter with a Roman jailer. Talked about in Philippians in, in Acts chapter 16. Because of the earthquake, the jailer was about to commit suicide because in those days, if you were a Roman jailer and your, and your prisoners escaped, you suffered the penalty they would have had. So the Roman jailer figures, how my prisoners left, I'm gonna die, I might as well kill myself. He took a sword out, Paul said, don't do that. Preached to him and his household the gospel and they became followers of Christ. So here are three people at least, who became a part of the church, and you can imagine some of their memories, and others that developed as people came into the church from various backgrounds, various stages of life, and they would talk about their experiences and just come together. Now you know this is true, how experiences can draw us together and create a fellowship. Jim and Marilyn Clevenger celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary this past week. That is an accomplishment. And some of you sent cards, some of you sent notes, some of you made videos. And, and if you saw the, the video that Jessica made of these notes and cards and videos that were sent to honor Jim and Marilyn, did you notice? Nobody said in these notes, I really like the way you changed your hair through the years. Nobody said, I like the different cars that you drove or the dogs that you have. I mean, they were in the pictures. You can tell. Hair changes and clothing <coughs> changes. I mean, that was apparent. But what did people write about in these notes? I remember the time I was going through something difficult in my life, and you just had me in your house. You didn't say anything. You didn't do anything necessarily, but you were there for me. That's what we remember, these kinds of experiences. Somebody said, I remember driving through Pennsylvania in the sleep. And I'll tell you, I've driven through Pennsylvania. It's not the most pleasant drive all the time. There are some hills and turns, and it's bad enough in ideal weather. You add some sleet, that can be really treacherous. You don't know if you're going to live or die around the next turn. But those treacherous moments, those uncertain moments, sometimes create the memories that draw us together. And through the years, we remember those experiences fondly. And yeah, we might have died, but we survived. I wasn't sure what was going to happen the next day, but you were there to hold my hand. You were there to put your arm around me. You were there to comfort me, and I got through it. Those are the kinds of memories that draw us together. It works for families as well, not just churches. I know when we were younger, of course, when you go into pastor, we're always younger, aren't we? Years ago when I was older, nobody said that. But when we'd be together, my mom and dad were still alive, and my grandmother was alive. You know, after a while, when you were with family, the stories start flowing. Some of them are even true. But once in a while, you know, our kids really weren't all that excited until my grandmother some nights would say, now Charles, that was my dad's name, now Charles, do you mind the time when, and our kids started gathering because they knew grandma's telling stories about granddaddy. 
And then a little bit later, they would ask my parents, do you have any stories about daddy getting beat? Oh, did they have stories. But it's those stories that draw us together as families. And at reunions, we tell some of the stories. Even though we've heard them lots of times, we still like to hear them because they're just so precious to us. It's like the song says. Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul in the stillness of the midnight. Precious, sacred scenes unfold. I'm sure many of you have experienced that with other people. You know what I would like to see sometime at one of our carrying in dinners? We don't call it a fellowship dinner, but we could. I would love sometime at one of our carrying in dinners. We'd have to find people ahead of time, I know, or it could be a disaster. Just have some people prime. Would you tell some stories that, ex that you've experienced in this church? Tell us about some of the people in the past and the things that you experienced with them so we can get that history of this church. But don't just go years in the past. What present memories do we have that just tend to draw us together? I'm convinced if a church has to go more than 30 or 40 years in the past to find these memories, that church is dying because there's nothing going on in the present. Now we need those stories 30, 40, 50 years ago, but we need to make stories in the present as well. Now how do we do that? Well, we do things together. Maybe small groups do things together. Whole groups do things together. Just think back in your own life. What are some precious memories you have of this church? How far back do you have to go? Let's start creating some new memories. I can create one right now. I can take this table and just fling it over. And... <laughs> I'm not going to because I'd probably have to clean it up. Now, that would be a memory. I'm not saying it's a good one. But sometime in the future, imagine this younger generation. Do you remember the time when Rick got crazy and flipped that thing off the, whatever this is up here? Yeah. Oh, man, we thought he lost it that day. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're sad, but they're precious memories. And as Paul is writing from his prison cell in the stillness of the night, he says to this church, I thank God for all of my remembrances of you. That's what contributed for him to a fellowship that brought joy to his life, even though he was in a prison cell 800 miles from these people. There's something else you see in this text, not just memories that create this fellowship, but in verse 7. He says, I have you in my heart. That's a good one to circle or mark. And then in verse 8, he says, I yearn for you all. Do you notice the emotion in those two phrases? I hold you in my heart, and I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So we have those memorable experiences that create the emotional bond that ties us together. You know, there's a song we used to sing when I was a kid growing up, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love. What is that tie that binds us together? Yes, it's Jesus Christ, but I think it's also these experiences that we have together that tends to bind us together and bring us together is that emotional bond that we have with each other. I think that's one reason why a lot of church experts recommend that churches that want to grow and have this growing fellowship have small groups, whether it's Sunday school classes or small groups that meet throughout the week. You see, in a small group, you can begin to bond more closely with five and six or eight people than you can with 40 or 50. And as we bond in these small groups, 
that bond carries us. There's a group bond with each other. And you have a church that's just growing more emotionally bonded to each other. Again, I think one of the problems in churches in the United States is there's just not a lot of emotional bonding. Oh, we go to church, we sit together, we say hi, we shake hands, we do the American thing, hi, how you doing, nice to see you, and, and hope they're past you before they actually tell you how they're doing, because we don't really want to know. But when you are emotionally bound to each other because of the experiences that create joy in our lives, When's the last time you woke up some Sunday morning and you realized it's Sunday morning? I can't wait to get to church to see so and so. You ever had one of those experiences? Well, I just can't wait to see this person. Wouldn't that be neat? Oh, I'm just so glad to see you today. I've been waiting since last Sunday to see you again. Not a time like this we often see each other more often than just Sunday, but then again, not always. So there's just that emotional tie. I'm so glad to see you today. I was looking forward to being here with you. I'll tell you, churches that have that kind of emotional attachment are churches that are close, they have a fellowship, they have joy, they've created memories, and they last through the years, and they keep creating new memories. That's one of the keys to a fellowship that produces joy, is having those emotional bonds. And then one more thing I want you to see, this is in verse 9. Paul says, my prayer for you. One of the things that kept Paul attached to this church was his praying for them. And notice specifically what he prays. He doesn't pray for their health, although I'm sure that meant a lot to him. To him. He didn't pray for a lot of things that we tend to pray for each other. But notice what he prays. I, my prayer is that your love may abound more and more. He's not suggesting they don't have any love for each other. He knows they do. He's been a part of that love. That's part of his experiences that he remembers. But he says, I just want your love to keep abounding and growing even more than it has already. Every church has room for love to grow and abound. Paul says, I just want you to be known as the church where they love each other. Regardless of background, businesswoman, former slave, Roman jailer, it doesn't matter. Your love for each other and your love for Jesus Christ just keeps growing. How does it do that? By spending time with each other. Some of you may have seen the article in the Camp Point Journal this week I submitted to them. I'm kind of surprised they printed it, really. Talked about you haven't seen it, I've created an article around a, a fake article, people we don't want to come to this church, and then develop some themes from that. And I meant every word I put in that article, if you saw it. Talked about who do we want to come to this church? I, I mentioned a whole lot of different kinds of people, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and people who could care less about politics. People who support Black Lives Matter and Antifa and people who think those organizations are from the devil. And I went on with all other kinds of people. We want all of these kinds of people to come to this church because we're all imperfect, and they certainly are too. I haven't found a perfect Republican or Democrat or non-political person. But it's not so we can change each other because that's not going to happen. I can't change you. Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit can. And as we together try to grow in the love of Jesus Christ that he has for us and he has, has for others, we're going to start changing. Not because the preacher said, you can't do this anymore, but because Jesus said, you know, I don't want my son and my children doing that. Oh, okay. Jesus will change us. 
we're not going to change anybody. But what the love is doing, Paul says, I want your love to abound more and more. And he goes on to say, I want you to have knowledge and discernment. You know, there's a lot of Christians who know enough Bible to pass Bible trivia games. They can tell you the color of the high priest's 12 stones in his breastplate. They can tell you all these little details. But they haven't discerned how to take the Bible and apply it to themselves. Paul says, I don't want you just to have knowledge. I want you to have discernment as well. To be able to take what God's word says and apply it to your own life. Pick out of that what is God saying to me through this text? What do I need to change because of what he said? What do I need to begin doing because that's what my Savior wants me to do? Paul says, I pray that to you, that you have knowledge but discernment. But he goes on, so you may approve what is excellent. Sometimes we back away from the word excellent in church because we're afraid people say, oh, you're just trying to show off. You're just trying to be better than everybody else. No, we're just trying to give God what he deserves. He deserves excellence. Of course, our level of excellence may be another church's level of, I can't believe you did that, but that's okay. It's excellent for us, and that's what matters. We're doing our best for God. Paul says, I pray that everything you do is done with excellence because God deserves it. And he says, and I want you to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That's his goal. Let God's word speak to you, guide you, change you, discern what he's saying to you. Don't worry about what God's saying to the person sitting next to you. What's God saying to you? Discern that. Let him speak to you so you can strive for excellence and you can strive to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Back in verse 6, he uses that phrase, the day of Jesus Christ, and now in verse 10, he uses the same phrase, for the day of Christ. In verse 6, he says, here's my confidence. God will be able to bring what he started in you to completion. Now in verse 10, but you've got a role to play in this. You've got to listen to him. You've got to let him speak to you. You've got to discern what he's saying so you can be pure and blameless. There's a lot of Christians who know what God says. They just don't live the way God says. They say, well, I know the Bible says I shouldn't do this. But I don't care. I'm going to do it anyhow. That's not a person who's discerning what the Spirit is saying through his word. Finally, Paul says, I, want you, I pray you're filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. That's what it's all about. God's praise and God's glory. We're not trying to promote First Christian Church in Camp Point because we think we're such a great outfit. We're not. But we want to give glory and praise to God through who we are and through what we do. And if we're doing the best we can, God is pleased with that. He doesn't compare us with other churches. Well, they've got a 50-member choir and a 10-piece brass band playing. You've got alto sax. Is that what it is? Soprano. Soprano sax. Shows what I know. And a drum, a guitar, and a piano. We don't have the 10-piece band and the 50-piece choir. God says, I don't care. Are you doing it for my praise and my glory? If you say yes, God says, then you're doing great. Keep it up. Now, how would you feel if one day you went to the mailbox and you got a card in the mail addressed just to you. And you got it in the house and you opened it and it's from another person in the church. And the card says, I want you to know I have prayed for you. And here's what I have prayed. That your love may abound more and more. That you would learn knowledge and discernment. 
to be excellent, to become pure and blameless at the day of Christ, filled with his righteousness to God's praise and glory. How would you respond? I guess one response would be, I don't think much of you, do they? Or the better response is, wow, somebody's actually praying this for me. If they sign it, that's good. If they don't, well, that's a mystery. Can you imagine if, if we all got to church here one Sunday and we're all holding cards from different people? Do you see what I got in the ministry? Somebody prayed for me, and this is what they prayed. Oh, that's going to create memories. And that's going to create emotional bonds. And that's going to bring us together like nothing has brought us together ever in the past. When we're praying for each other. That whatever we do in life is to God's praise and God's glory. If we're lifting each other up with those kinds of prayers, if you take that book that has all the names and addresses and just start going through, whether you send a card or not, just start going through. Maybe one day take one name and just pray what Paul prayed for the church in Philippi. I guarantee there will begin to be some changes that are for the better. Our love will abound more and more because God will honor those prayers. We'll grow in knowledge and discernment. We'll search for what is excellent and strive to be excellent to the praise and the glory of God. And God will bless a group of people working for that. That's the kind of fellowship that brings joy to our hearts and joy to our church and just begins to ooze out of these walls and doors and windows into our community. And wouldn't it be great if we went around Camp Point and asked people, do you know about the Christian church in Camp Point? Oh, yeah. What can you tell me about that church? Oh, that's a joyful people. And they really know how to love everybody. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to be known for in a community? Love and joy. Joy in God. Would you pray with me? Father, it's easy to look into these words and say, yeah, that's what we need to be doing. But sometimes it's harder to carry it out. We have well, we live in different places, we have different schedules, there's just a lot of things that work against us. But Father, I pray that we would be like the church in Philippi, as Paul describes it, that we would begin to work at making the memories that create the emotional bonds, that encourage us to pray for each other, positive things that you might work in us and carry to completion what you have begun in this church all those years ago. We're still here. We still have a purpose. There's still something you want to do with this church. Whether we're 30 people or 300 people, you still want to do something through us. May we open ourselves to you and to experience fellowship with you that we carry down to fellowship with each other and begin to experience and live out the joy that comes from being in Christ and becoming like Christ. God, this is my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. verses of my life to be.
I never thought that I would live to see the day when the church house doors would be locked on Sunday morning. I hope that the two and a half months we were forbidden to assemble together to celebrate the Lord's Supper and the worship of God will make us realize what a precious freedom we enjoy to be able to come together in this house of worship today. A privilege millions of people in various countries of this world do not have. The next time we are forbidden to assemble may be due may not be due to a virus, but be due to sheer hatred for God, Jesus, and everything Christian. Something else we should be thankful for and not take for granted is the fact that Jesus was willing out, his, out of his love for us to leave his heavenly home and come to earth to make the perfect sacrifice for our sins with his own blood. In the 10th chapter of the book of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life voluntarily, he says. End quote. In doing so, Christ established a new covenant with us, his sheep, offering us the gift of eternal life in his heavenly kingdom. So as we partake of the bread and the cup this morning, let us do so with a spirit of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we thank you that Jesus was willing to come down and to suffer and die a cruel death on the cross so that we might have the hope of eternal life with you in your heavenly kingdom forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, take a look at our slideshow that's coming up and find the email address for the church. Send us an email. Let us know you're watching. You might have some questions about our church or some questions about today's sermon. Please feel free to send them in, and we'll, be get, we'll get back to you just as quickly as we can with the response, trying to answer all your questions that you may have. 
I know one of the things I was taught when I went to graduate school, University in Maryland, was that the human does not have a soul. That's not a biblical concept, but it's a very common one these days. And as Logan talked about the soul, a lot of people look at his, hear that and say, nah, it doesn't happen. But the Bible is very clear. We have souls and they are important parts of our lives. In fact, Jesus came to save our souls. And so if you have questions about your relationship with God or questions about is your soul saved, contact us. We'll be glad to talk with you. Uh, email, text, face-to-face. -face. We'll be glad to help answer your questions and calm some of the fears that you may have. So with that in mind, we hope you have a good week, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye.